As staff and faculty and administrators and board, we covenant ourselves to a vision of God and of the Christian faith in a vision of life together as a code of conduct. But as a place of Quaker hospitality and welcome, we welcome folks from all religious creeds or no creed at all. And yet we encourage them to come into this view of faith seeking understanding and this way of life together while you're here. And that that can be a sort of uncomfortable pinching and pulling place depending on <laughs> what question you're, you're asking. Indeed, inviting ourselves and our students into such a code brings with it certain risks. The main risk being an outward appearance of religion without inner freedom and transformation of the heart or a tradition for tradition's sake. And so in order to resist that from time to time, you have to pull back and think again about the biblical and theological origins of your commitments, assess them, and to ask yourself, what's the rationale? What's the spirit of the letter? How can we think again in our own contemporary context with nuance? Certainly our university's commitment, this is a really long introduction by the way, I apologize, but I feel obliged having pulled this thing together and thrown uh, Wes and others into it and Dr. Favalli to give some sense of the rationale and the purpose. Our commitment to a positive traditional and biblical understanding of marriage as a lifelong covenant between a man and a woman certainly implies certain things. Prohibition of sex outside of marriage within the scriptural horizon. It poses particular challenges for the path of discipleship for single people. It also implies, as, as Dr. Hill states in Washington Waiting, something of the traditional position that the Christian church has held with almost total unanimity throughout the centuries. Namely, that same-sex sexual expression was not God's original creative intention for humanity. That is, on the contrary, it's somehow a tragic sign of human nature and relationships being fractured by sin. Therefore, that same-sex sexual activity goes against God's express will for all human beings, especially those who trust in Christ. Right? There's the wedge and the challenge that the church is wrestling with. Holding such a traditional biblical perspective invites important questions that we must take great care to wrestle with and to answer and to try to work out the implications of. And really, I pulled this event together because I simply want to do a better job myself. How then are you to live faithfully as a gay or lesbian Christian who finds yourself with same-sex sexual attraction then? How does that sense of bearing some tragic sign of human nature not single you out? And how do you know how to disentangle that sign from what's good, whole, and unique about you as a person made in the image of God who's a gay or lesbian Christian? How are we to live this out as a community together in a politicized, polarized world? How are we to think and talk to one another about all these questions? How does the church, or at least a church-affiliated college like our own, look in light of these commitments and the experience of our brothers and sisters and members among us? Assuredly, our commitment to Christian marriage and sex poses a challenge to gay and lesbian Christians, as well as heterosexual, single, unmarried Christians. It also poses a challenge for heterosexual Christian couples and those in the vocation of family life, which, as we all know, can often become its own sorrowful, tragic sign of human nature and fraction relationships. How can the church be a place of true hospitality, bearing witness to the larger household of God, which is our true homeland? How can we all learn together that in the end, all of our romantic and erotic longings and friendships are in the final analysis only signposts of something much greater, our eternal hunger for God? Our goal in this forum is not to represent or engage every single perspective on human sexuality on the planet, or even all contemporary Christian views on sexuality, but rather in this case is to clarify our institution's own position and wrestle with its implications for those among us. It's an in-house dialogue, a heated family debate at the Thanksgiving table, if you will, for an institution that's trying to advance its own understanding and its shared vocabulary and understand the implications of its commitments. As a Christian ethicist, I'm always leery of isolating moral questions like the question of sexuality and questions that are in vogue because this risks limiting the wholeness of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ on the narrow way. It also risks highlighting special, special moral struggles. A complete forum on faith and sexuality in the long run will necessarily include a deepened understanding of our perspective on the goods of marriage 
and the rigorous call to holiness and chastity and sexual practice for every Christian, single, gay, straight, and a call away from the exploitative inhumanity of our hookup and sexual self-actualization -actual culture. Too many syllables, sorry. We're not doing this for him to special out, to single out special sinners. God has no favorites, or if he does, his favorite his favor seems inversely related to the relative merit or worth of his saints. All of us were created equal with great dignity in the image of God. And all of us have fallen short of his glory. The electing God of Israel has chosen us in his only son and saved us according to his righteousness. He's looking for something else from us, an attitude, a posture of the heart, a listening ear, a waiting and attending to him and to others. So everyone here tonight is welcome, and we're glad that you're here, no matter your perspective. We invite all to engage respectfully in a spirit of truth-seeking afterwards in a dialogue that's set by the frame of our speaker tonight. It is a great special privilege to have Dr. Wesley Hill, and you'll forgive me for winding up so long to get to this. He was educated at Wheaton um, College in Illinois and Durham, UK for his master's and his PhD. He's now associate professor of New Testament at Western Theological Seminary uh, in Holland, Michigan, not Portland, Oregon. He's an Episcopal priest on attachment with the cathedral in Pittsburgh. He's spoken, spoken and lectured at numerous Christian colleges and seminaries in the U.S. and internationally. In 2008, he was a member of the St. Augustine Seminar, which I like the sound of that, held at Lambeth Palace to prepare resources for the upcoming Lambeth Conference of the Anglican Communion in 2022. He's the author of Washed and Waiting, which we have for sale, Reflections on Christian Faithfulness and Homosexuality. Also, Paul and the Trinity, Persons, Relations, and the Pauline Letters. Also, Spiritual Friendship, Finding Love in the Church as a celibate gay Christian, and also the Lord's Prayer, a guide to praying to our Father. He's a contributing editor for Comment Magazine. He writes regularly for Christianity Today, The Living Church Online, and other publications. He does many things. He's really a rare voice and a prophet in the wilderness, I would say, someone who ad adheres to a traditional biblical understanding of marriage and same-sex sexual expression while being a gay Christian man. He's thus often alienated from far-leaning conservatives and progressives and finds himself a resident alien in this world and is thus perhaps closer to the heart of God and his kingdom than most of us. It's a pleasure and privilege to have uh, Dr. Wesley Hill with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you so much, Joseph. Can you all hear me okay? Uh, thank you for that introduction, really kind. As we get started tonight, uh, we're gonna be talking about the order of love, the reordering of our loves. And I thought it might be appropriate to begin with a prayer which expresses this hope that God would rewire us, that God would orient us toward God. So uh, would you bow and pray with me um, this, this prayer? Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed, where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, it's really a pleasure to be with you. I have been to your campus once, but uh, this is uh, a chance to get to know you better and uh, have more interaction. There will be some time for Q&A and discussion at the end of the evening tonight, so be thinking about uh, what this raises for you. I wanna talk about the trouble with normal and the order of love. And I'll just say a little bit more about where I'm coming from so you know uh, a little more about me. Um, I, as 
Joseph mentioned, I wrote a book uh, over 10 years ago called Washed and Waiting, uh, and it was my effort to try to describe the Christian life as I am living it, and to try to connect with other people who are in a similar place. Um, I realized I was gay when I was about 13 or 14. I uh, eventually uh, gained the courage to talk about that when I was a student at Wheaton. And uh, through a lot of wrestling and a lot of prayer and a lot of agonizing, I found myself um, convinced of what Joseph just articulated as the position of this college, uh, which is that God designed marriage to be the union of male and female, uh, ordered toward the, the welcoming of children. And so I found myself unable in good conscience to pursue a same-sex marriage. But at the same time, I experienced no diminishment of my same-sex attraction. Uh, there were a lot of um, testimonies of people becoming ex-gay uh, that were certainly prominent in the, in the 90s when I was grappling with my sexuality. But those stories did not seem to illuminate my childhood development, and they didn't seem to have any impact on my uh, experience of my desire. And so I found myself, um, you know, just identifying as gay, owning the fact that I'm gay. I don't expect that to change. I mean, God can do whatever God wants to do, but I don't expect it to change. But I'm also not pursuing a same-sex marriage. I'm pursuing a life of celibacy. Uh, chastity. Um, and uh, I ended up, after I wrote Wash and Waiting, which kind of described my story, I ended up following it up and writing uh, a book on friendship. Because the burning question became for me not so much what I am saying no to, but what am I called to say yes to? Uh, you're going to hear from one of my favorite speakers tomorrow, Eve Tushnet. Eve has a great line where she says, You can't have a vocation of no. You can't build your sense of calling and living around what you're denying yourself, as important as that is. You have to have something that is beckoning you onward, that is, that is guiding you toward a telos. And so this was my effort to describe that, to write about friendship as something that, that I'm called to pursue. Um, uh, you know, it's one thing to, to think about living without sex, but none of us are called to live without love. And this book was exploring uh, what forms of love might be open for someone like me who is pursuing a life of celibacy. So I've, I've, that's my background, and I, I have been speaking at places like George Fox for a number of years now, trying to help Christians uh, think well about how we might uh, nurture the faith of those in our communities who know that we are gay or lesbian, and who wonder what it looks like to follow Christ in the midst of that, in light of that. So um, what I'm going to share tonight is where my thinking is taking me these days. Uh, I've, I, I was talking with uh, Dr. Favali earlier today about um, uh, some of the ways that my, my uh, thinking has shifted since I wrote my first two books in my, in my 20s and early 30s. Um, I turned 40 this year, and, and there, are, there are different sort of seasons of celibacy, seasons of singleness, and the kind of questions that I'm wrestling with today are not exactly the same as the ones that I was wrestling with when I wrote the earlier books. So I want to talk specifically about how we think about the conversation we've all been having in the Christian world for the last few years about sexuality and marriage. And what I'm going to propose to you tonight is that that conversation could be better. I think we've gotten stuck in many ways, and uh, part of the stuckness, as I read it, is between two competing understandings of normalcy. So have a look at this slide. Um, this, is, this is what many Christian people consider to be, quote unquote, normal sexuality. Listen to one voice here. Behold the institution of marriage. It is one of the most marvelous and enduring gifts to humankind. This divine plan was revealed to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and then described succinctly in Genesis 2.24, where we read, For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. I think so far so good. But then the author goes on and says this, 
More than 5,000 years have come and gone since that point of origin, yet every civilization in the history of the world has been built upon it. Despite today's skeptics who claim that marriage is an outmoded and narrow-minded Christian concoction, the desire of men and women to leave and cleave has survived and thrived through times of prosperity, peace, famine, wars, epidemics, and every other possible circumstance and condition. It has been the bedrock of culture in Asia, Africa, Europe, North America, South America, Australia, and even Antarctica. You hear what's, what he's doing there? This author is saying, we don't, we don't base our understanding of what Christian marriage is simply on the Bible. You can, you can just read it right off culture. You can look at human history. That should be enough to convince you that this is what's normal. This is what's natural. We have to, we have to unlearn what's natural in order to pursue deviancy in this perspective. Well, on the other side, the argument has been that homosexuality is just as natural and normal as heterosexuality. This is the cover, um, uh, the cover for the story that Andrew Sullivan wrote years ago in the New Republic, where he argued that uh, gay couples were virtually normal. It's the title of one of his books, virtually normal. In other words, no different than the mainstream, no different than straight people. Listen to how one very popular Christian book puts it. This is from Matthew Vine's book, God and the Gay Christian. He says, same-sex attraction is completely natural to me. It's not something I chose or something I can change. He goes on to say, even though past societies did not recognize it, the fact is now undeniable that gay men and women exist. Notice the argument there. He's saying, I look inside and I realize I didn't go looking for this. And by the way, that's my experience too. Um, this is something that seems to be hardwired in me. It's something that seems to be the product of living just as human a life as any straight person is living. And therefore, my job is to recognize its naturalness, its normalcy, and not view myself as, as somehow wrong or deviant because I experience this sexuality. It's normal. Or as Sullivan says, it's virtually normal. One writer has described this perspective this way. Sexual orientation is not a choice but a given. It is part of a person's essential makeup. If, as biologists have observed, over 400 animal species exhibit same-sex sexual activity, and if lesbian, gay, and bisexual orientations are experienced by human beings as unchosen, hardwired, and resistant to change, then arguments that gay and lesbian life violates nature lose their credibility. If we can show that it's naturally occurring, then the biblical traditional picture that homosexuality is somehow against nature is shown to be false. So what we have here, I think, are two incompatible clashing visions of what's normal. On the one hand, you have conservatives saying the, the nuclear family, as we, as we uh, see it represented here, this is what's normal. Any deviation from this represents uh, a turn to the unnatural. And then we have the mirror image of that same argument here, that in fact, homosexuality is just as normal. It's just as much a feature of our biological experience as heterosexuality is. And that's the way I think the debate has played out even among those of us who confess Christ. We find ourselves appealing to categories of what is normal, what's natural. And oftentimes that's based on our own experience or our own powers of observation. What I'd like to do tonight is to introduce you to some voices who have trouble with this whole idea of normalcy. 
who wonder whether the conversation we ought to be having should center around what's normal in this way. There are a lot of um, voices that I want to bring in here, so um, I'm going to try to uh, summarize well so that you can follow, but I, fr I want to start by talking about what has come to be called queer theory. And some of you will have heard of that, some of you will not. I'm going to assume that you haven't. Um, and those of you who do know what, what, what I'm talking about um, can hopefully just enjoy uh, a, little, a little refresher. But um, when we think about critical theory, um, it's, a, it's a kind of umbrella term that, that comprises a number of different um, uh, threads or, or uh, approaches. So I've put up here some of, the, um, some of the key features of what has come to be called critical theory or critical theories. Um, you, may have, you may have heard of, of this because there's been a lot of conversation about it in the Christian world lately. Um, uh, many Christian voices are saying that critical theory is actually incompatible fundamentally with Christianity. I'm going to argue something a little different tonight. I think there's a strange kind of synergy that we see between some of the voices of of queer theorists and what we're going to find in St. Augustine of Hippo, a great Christian saint. But um, one of the, one of the um, concerns here in, in critical theory is, is the whole idea of a hermeneutic of suspicion. And critical theorists will look at something that we take to be normal or natural, and they'll try to, to put that under the microscope and say, who is actually benefiting who is gaining power from describing this condition or state of affairs as the, the way things naturally are? So there's a, there's a suspicion that when someone says to you, you know, this is, just, this is just the way nature is, this is normal, a critical theorist will say, not so fast. Uh, what's, the, what's the history of that whole idea? And, and then we come to the second point, the archaeology of knowledge. We, we trace the way things that we take for granted that seem to be natural and normal, we trace the way that has come to be in culture and in history. The argument here is that something like so-called traditional marriage wasn't always understood to be natural. It had to be produced as natural. It had to be described as normal. Um, think about, for example, just in our own scriptures, the Hebrew Bible, uh, marriage in the Old Testament looks very different than what we understand marriage to be today. Uh, there are, there are uh, lots of uh, polygamous unions in the Old Testament, so that, that seemed normal back then. So the whole idea that we consider male and female marriage to be natural and normal now, well, that's the product of a history. That's what a critical theorist would say. Uh, Jamie Smith, uh, professor at Calvin University, he, he sums this up really well. He says, there's no claim to truth that is innocent. There is no knowledge that simply falls into our minds from the sky, pristine and untainted. That's what critical theorists are interested in exploring. How, how, do, how does the, the knowledge that we take to be natural, how is it actually, in fact, produced culturally? Well, let me introduce you to a couple of key voices here. This is Michel Foucault. Foucault was uh, a gay man, uh, a French uh, philosopher, and the author of one of the most important texts in the history of critical theory and queer theory, specifically. This is, in fact, one of the founding texts of what we understand to be queer theory today. Michel Foucault's History of Sexuality, originally published in English in three volumes. There is now the fourth volume that's just been translated this past year. So uh, Foucault is still very much uh, a part of the conversation, but he builds on um, the insight that what happened in the 19th century was a shift in the way we thought about homosexuality. I want to read you just a, a brief excerpt from volume one of his History of Sexuality. He says, as defined by the ancient civil or canonical codes, sodomy was a category of forbidden Acts. Notice, behaviors, acts. Their author, the, the, the person who did these acts, was nothing more than the juridical subject of them. But the 19th century homosexual became 
a personage, a past, a case history, and a childhood, a character, a form of life. What he's arguing there is that our, our understanding of what it means to be a gay person is in fact relatively recent. There have always been same-sex sexual acts, same-sex sexual behaviors, but it was only with the study of sexology in the 19th century in Germany that we came to think of there being a particular sort of person who does those acts, a homosexual person, a gay person. Foucault goes on, homosexuality appeared as one of the forms of sexuality when it was transposed from the practice of sodomy onto a kind of interior androgyny, a hermaphrodism of the soul. The sodomite, before the 19th century, was simply a renegade or a backslider. The homosexual, understood as a person, is now a species. Do you see what Foucault's doing there? He's, he's taking something that we think of as naturally occurring. Well, this is just how I am. I was born gay. I was born this way, and he's saying, no, you weren't. Culture produced this idea of a gay person, a homosexual person. And if you had been born prior to the 19th century, you would not have thought of yourself that way. You might have behaved very similarly, but you wouldn't have conceptualized yourself in the same way. Another, um, well, let me, before I go on to Judith Butler, I put this, this cover on here, not because it's a, a, an essential text in queer theory, but because of the title. The title captures something here, the, the invention of heterosexuality. Um, there, I could have mentioned another book that I read recently by Hannah Blank called Straight, The Surprisingly Short History of Heterosexuality. And the point is, these things have, have a story. They have, they have a, a, a cultural production. They didn't just fall from the sky. They aren't simply, according to queer theorists, naturally occurring. They have to be produced. The next person I want to talk about is Judith Butler. Uh, Butler is the author of Gender Trouble which is a classic, uh, along with Foucault, founding text of what we know of today as queer theory. What Butler argues in this book is that when we think about the distinction, she published this in 1990, by the way, when we think about the distinction between sex and gender, a lot of us tend to think of sex as what is simply there. It's, it's the biological givenness of our bodies. Um, some bodies have penises, some bodies have vaginas, and that's the raw material, that's the plumbing. And then gender is how we embody that, how we live that out, how we express it culturally. Well, Butler comes along and says, actually, no. The very idea of a stable, sex binary, male and female, that too is a cultural production. That is just as, just as much a product of culture as gender is. Let me give it to you in her words. Because sex, as we think of it, the sex difference of male and female bodies, because sex is a political and cultural interpretation of the body, there is no sex-gender distinction along conventional lines. Gender is built into sex, and sex proves to have been gender from the start. And what she's getting at there is the fact that we organize humanity into male and female categories She's saying that's an, that's an accident. It need not have been that way. We might have decided the most important salient difference between human beings is those who have blue eyes and those who have eyes that are all the other colors. And the fact that we think of humanity as this dimorphic uh, male and female is, is, in a sense, unnatural. That's her argument. Uh, it, it, it may be very powerful. It may shape our, our lives in many ways. But it, we need not have thought of ourselves that way. So you can see how uh, queer theorists are very interested in resisting the categorization of people 
They're very interested in challenges to the notion of essential or natural identities. Queer theorists try to trouble binaries, gender trouble, Butler's book is called. Male versus female, gay versus straight. Uh, queer theorists are interested in the ways that these are not simply naturally occurring phenomena, but they're the product of the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. And they're often used to reinforce the power of those who are in power. Queer theories are about, and here I'm quoting from Meg John Barker and Julia Shelley, Queer theories are about drawing on post-structuralist theories to examine power relations relating to sex, sexuality, and gender. Queer theories are about destabilizing the taken-for-granted dominant understanding which assumes that heterosexuality is the normal or natural standard of sexuality and categorizes people in relation to this by exposing how sexual and gender identities are constructed through the available ways of thinking and being in different times and places and performed. Something that we do rather than something that we essentially are. Now you can see how from a queer theorist's perspective, the debate that we've been having in the churches is actually rather passe, rather boring. On the conservative side, we have people saying heterosexuality is normal and natural. On the progressive side, we have gay voices saying, no, no, homosexuality is normal and natural too. And for a queer theorist, that whole way of framing the debate is sort of outmoded uh, because the real question is whose power interests are being served and what are the history of these concepts that we assume are natural, but in fact are anything but. Well, what I want to argue in the, in the time we have left is that in some ways, not always, certainly, but in some ways, the vision of sexuality and life before God that we find in St. Augustine of Hippo has some surprising points of resonance and connection with some of the questions that queer theorists are asking. And I think that for us as Christians, we need not be afraid of these questions, but we can follow St. Augustine in engaging them and viewing them as places where we can uh, speak to and with uh, our, our culture. I want to talk about um, Augustine's uh, vision now with you. Uh, in order to do that, let me, let me um, give you a, a bit of a teaser here. This is from Lynn Marie Tonstad. She is a uh, professor um, of uh, queer theology and literature at Yale. And she says, queer theory shares with certain forms of Protestantism, and I would, I would say Augustinianism, a suspicion of ideas of wholeness, self-possession, and self-determination and instead looks at the ways that human beings are mysteries to ourselves. I think that's right. I think that Augustine is in many ways a kind of, I won't say ally, but definitely a conversation partner for the queer theorists that are at work today. And I want to try to explain that. I want to present Augustine's view in light of his understanding of the history of redemption. Augustine thinks in terms of the story of God's engagement with humanity. God gave us our being in creation. We rebelled against God by turning away from God and fell into sin. Augustine thinks that we are actually born in that condition. We don't choose it. We inherit it. Uh, we, we, are, we are born with wills that are misdirected away from the good. And the good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ has come among us to transform us not to leave us where we are, not to affirm us where we are, but to beckon us into a life that we've not known because we never had it. We, we fell from our place in creation. And so God is in the business of restoring and rewiring, or as Augustine would say, reordering our loves. Our loves are all over the place. They're misdirected, they're, they're uh, fixated on the wrong objects, or they may be fixated on the right object, but in the wrong way. 
our hearts are, are full of misdirected desires. And the story of God's redemption, beginning with our baptism, is that we find those desires drawn back to their magnetic true north, which is God uh, in Christ, the vision of God that we're waiting for. So how does Augustine uh, do this with regard to uh, sexuality? Well, he starts off by talking about sexuality as a good of creation. He describes marriage as instituted by God and having three basic goods. The first of these goods is, in Latin, proles, or procreation. Augustine thinks that uh, marriage is for the sake of having children. It's for the sake of the world. It's the means by which God's world is populated and the city of God, the destination of our lives, it's the means by which that heavenly country is populated as well. One Augustinian commentator points out that this is, this is arguably right there on the surface of Genesis itself. Children do not appear in Genesis as an optional extra to the otherwise self-contained nature of marriage. Rather, procreation is an inseparable and intrinsic good of marriage, the result of God's blessing and command to be fruitful. Children are not inserted into the partner's companionship from the outside by the wave of a wand, but are a blessing of God that arises from the heart of the relationship of male and female. A child is the entirely proper and fitting expression in the oneness of his or her flesh of the parent's own one flesh bond. That's the first good of marriage for Augustine. The second good in Latin is fides. We might say in modern English, fidelity or exclusivity. A man leaves his father and mother and holds fast to his wife, cleaves to his wife and the two become one flesh. So not only, Augustine thinks, is marriage good for the world, insofar as it bears children, but it's good for the spouses. There's a, there's a love and a commitment and a companionship that marriage represents. And then thirdly, Augustine says sacramentum, permanence, indissolubility, indissolubility. The fact that the husband and wife cleave to one another and become one flesh is ultimately a sign of something greater. It's a sign of Christ's love for the church, which is, of course, what Paul tells us in Ephesians 5. Marriage is not simply good for the world. It's not simply good for the spouses. It's for the sake of God. God uses marriage as a sign to tell the world something about God and his love for the church. Well, all of that is pre-fall, all of that is before sin comes and messes everything up. Augustine thinks that sexuality, more than any other area of human life, can demonstrate the radical fallenness that we all experience. Look at what he, listen to what he says here. This is in his great work, The City of God. He says, not even those who love this pleasure of sexual intercourse are roused either to marital intercourse or to impure and shameful acts strictly at their own will. And that's key for Augustine. He thinks that in, in our experience of sexuality, we see our lack of control, our lack of ability to instantiate the good. And even in acts that are permitted, such as marital sexual intimacy, he thinks we still, even there, see the effects of the fall. He says this, such is the present condition of mortal men that the connubial intercourse and lust are at the same time in action. In other words, Augustine wants to say, even what you consider to be the most normal sexuality, the, the sexual intimacy of husband and wife, even there we see disorder. Even there is, is a lack of normalcy, if we're defining normal as what God intended in the beginning, in creation. Philip Carey puts it this way, the procreative sexuality of married men and women includes desire for the right object, but it is always excessive 
or self-seeking or disordered in some way. Hence, in Augustine's teaching, every sexual act, even of married Christians, is sin in need of forgiveness, precisely because it involves our consenting to our inevitably concupiscent sexual desires rather than mortifying them. Augustine should help us recognize that outside the Garden of Eden, there is no innocent sexuality. And insofar as those of us like myself who understand ourselves to be traditional conservative Christians, insofar as we are giving the, the idea that there is an innocent sexuality that is somehow untainted by the fall, we're missing it. We're not certainly not in step with Augustine, and I, I also would say not in step with Scripture. So, what Augustine argues is that if we want to think Christianly about sexuality, we shouldn't think in terms of God affirming who we presently are, God rubber stamping where we are now. Instead, we should think of our loves as in need of redirection, reordering, being drawn back to their source in God. All human desires are disordered, which is to say all human beings, without exception, love the wrong things or we love the right things in the wrong way. And we're saved not through rational moral effort, but through the enticement and the ravishment of divine love. Why do I camp out on Augustine? This is from Paul Tillich. Augustine's theology contains more profound insights into the negativities of the human predicament than that of anyone else in early Christianity. Rowan Williams says it this way. Augustine's undiminished appeal to a post-Freudian generation like ours has much to do with the fact that he confronts and accepts the unpalatable truth that rationality is not the most important factor in human experience. That the human subject is a point in a vast structure of forces whose operation is tantalizingly obscure to reason. Augustine also argues that God is in the business of reordering our loves. One Augustine scholar who I really like, Charles Matthews, he says it this way, to begin to see God's will for you as normative for your life will inevitably disrupt your habituated affections in manifold ways. In other words, God doesn't come and find us beautiful. God comes and makes us beautiful through his love. He, he recreates us, wooing us away from our lives of sin and misery, pointing us to true fulfillment. And this is why, I love this, this is, I, I have to believe he wrote this with a smile. Uh, Peter Brown, in his classic biography of St. Augustine, he says, he's talking about how Augustine was, was fighting against Pelagius, who was eventually declared a heretic. And Pelagius, you might think, is the nicer person, because he actually thinks we're not that bad. We just need instruction and help in the moral life to, to get a bit of improvement. Augustine said, no, we're bad to the bone. So Augustine looks like the bad guy, Pelagius looks like the good guy, but Brown says, paradoxically, it's actually Augustine with his harsh emphasis on baptism as the only way to salvation. It's Augustine who appears as the advocate of moral tolerance. For within the exclusive fold of the Catholic Church, Augustine could find room for the whole spectrum of human failings. In other words, his, his strong doctrine of sin, that we're, we're all multiply broken and in need of reordering, it actually makes him more compassionate, not less. It becomes the basis for his, his pastoral uh, defense of human mediocrity. Well, in closing, I want to ask tonight, what if we took this to heart? 
How would it change the way we talk to each other about sexuality in the church? Could we, and this is, this is a very modest hope, but this is the hope I want to give you tonight. Could we, maybe not necessarily all agree, but could we elevate the quality of our disagreement? Could we enter into a more fruitful debate with each other over the meaning and the purpose and the, and the shape of sexual life in the church? I want to give you, in closing, just some hopeful signs that maybe that is the case. This is um, a professor at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Eugene Rogers. Um, he is, like me, an Episcopalian, and he, he, he wrote a book about this that is, you know, on the surface of it, we would say it's a, it's a progressive book, it's a, it's a gay-affirming book, um, but it does it in a way that is, I think, usefully surprising to someone like me. His book came out a few years ago. It's called Sexuality and the Christian Body. And what he argues in that book is that gay marriage is not about affirming and celebrating uh, the desire that exists in gay lives as it is. He argues that gay marriage is all about sanctification. It's all about giving gay people a way not to stay where they are at present, but to form covenant lives together so that they might be purified so that they might be able to unlearn selfishness and grow in the Christian life. Listen to how he says it. He says, the marriage vows do this, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. Those ascetic vows, which Russian theologians compare to the vows of monastics, commit the couple to carry forward the solidarity of God and God's people. Marriage makes a school for virtue where God prepares the couple for life with himself by binding them for life to each other. Marriage is for sanctification. A means by which God can bring a couple to himself by turning their limits to their good. And then he says, with a wink, no conservative I know has seriously argued that same-sex couples need sanctification any less than opposite-sex couples do. I think that's a funny line. Um, and that, to me, represents a kind of position I can't, I can't ultimately agree with. I don't ultimately see it in Scripture. But it's a position that I can recognize as motivated by Christian concerns. It's, it's premised not on the idea that gay sexuality is normal and natural and therefore it just needs to be rubber stamped. It's premised on the idea that gay people, like everyone else, is in, gay people are in need, we are in need of having our loves reordered, reoriented toward God. Another voice that I found particularly helpful is Sarah Coakley. Sarah Coakley is a priest in the Episcopal Church and uh, she has written um, uh, the first volume of a planned series of books um, called God, Sexuality, and the Self. Her whole argument in this book is that God draws us to himself by enticing us, wooing us, beckoning us, engaging our desires precisely so that we might be transformed. She says, the fallen differences of worldly gender are transfigured by the interruptive activity of the Holy Spirit, drawing gender into purgation, purging it of what is, of what is impure, purgation and transformation. Ascetic transformation, ascetic fidelity, she writes. These are the goals which so fatally escape the notice of a culture bent either on pleasure or on moral condemnation. To escape between the horns of that false dilemma is necessarily a spiritual and bodily task involving great patience and commitment from sexuality and the self to participation in the Trinitarian God, this way lies a long haul of erotic purgation, but its goal is one of infinite delight. Now, if you ask Sarah Coakley, you can find her saying this in print, she would, she would identify as gay-affirming. She's in favor of same-sex marriage, but not 
for the reason that it's somehow just naturally occurring and therefore it's okay. Not because it's normal, but because she sees in gay marriage the promise of this purgative transformation of desire, whereby our loves are shaped by God's love for us. That's a position that I can have a fruitful debate with. That's a position that I can have a, a recognizably Christian conversation about. Likewise, on the so-called non-affirming side, um, I'm, I'm sort of setting up our next speaker for tomorrow. Um, these are some uh, quotes from uh, my friend and much admired um, writer, Eve Tushnet. Eve has written, right now, young gay people mostly hear a catechism of silence. Not about church teaching on gay marriage or homosexual acts, about which they're wincingly aware, but about their futures. I can, I can attest to this from my own experience. I've heard a lot, I've read a lot about what I'm not supposed to be doing with my body, but there's precious little in our conversations about what it might look like for me as a celibate person, not to simply have God say, okay, you're fine now that you're celibate, but what, what does transformation look like? What does sanctification look like? How am I called not to stay where I am, not to be affirmed where I am, but to be remade, to be redeemed? She goes on, right now, gay teens hear a robust yes from the mainstream media and gay culture. From the church, they hear only a no. And you can't have a vocation of not gay marrying and not having sex. You can't have a vocation of no. And this is one of the reasons I'm so excited about Eve's newest book, which is all about speaking to people like me who are in the trenches, wondering where is God in the midst of this struggle with my sexuality? How can my longings be offered to God as a sacrifice? And how can they be, how can they be purified and trained in the direction of love? self-giving love. Well, friends, I'm conscious I've thrown a lot of ideas, a lot of names, a lot of uh, thoughts at you tonight. Hopefully some of it is at least somewhat intelligible. Uh, but I want to leave you with this. My hope is not necessarily that we might all on a campus like this come to the same mind. I don't think we will. But I actually am very hopeful that we could have a more fruitful, a more Christ-like, a more God-honoring conversation. Thank you so much. Amazing, Dr. Hill, thank you so much. What a feast, wow. Um, there's a lot to take in. We really wanna have a chance to hear from you. And again, this dialogue sort of continues. We'll have time now. We'll be again here tomorrow with Eve Tushnet at, at 1.30 and time after that, and then tomorrow evening in the panel. So obviously so much to chew on. There's so many angles, but that was um, really extraordinary. So it's a chance now for you. Um, I'll run the mic around uh, like a monkey to make sure everybody can hear the question. Um, so give me a chance chance to run toward you, but I'll let anybody kick it off, especially if there's a student um, who's willing. Yeah? No. I had a non-student. Oh, we'll go with, you look like a student. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Thank you. Dr. Hill, thank you. What would your college self like to hear as a message to you that you're not hearing, that a college student wouldn't hear now? Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think, I think it goes back to, um, you know, what, what I was recognizing here with Eve, that a lot of us, and I'd be curious to hear if it's different now, but when I was in college, it was the early 2000s, you know, or Burgerfell was not even on the horizon. Um, uh, it, was, it was a time when there was no public support group for LGBTQ students. Um, there is one now at the college that I went to. Um, and I mainly heard, when I heard about homosexuality, I mainly heard about the, the New Testament passages that condemned same-sex sexual behavior. And then I heard an explanation of why they might do that, why that condemnation might be there. But when I, when I looked for 
um, insight into how someone like me should, should find love, should be able to give love and receive love, I didn't hear much. I heard um, expectations that maybe gay people could become straight and marry someone of the opposite sex, but I didn't hear much of anything about what it might look like to embrace a life of celibacy and find that not to be automatically isolating and alienating. And I think what I would, what I would, what I wish I had heard is that my sexuality, like everyone else's sexuality, is broken and in need of redemption, but I am called, just like every other member of the body of Christ, to love. I'm called to give love and receive love. I'm called to not be alone. I'm, I'm summoned into a life of community, um, hospitality, friendship. Um, I've written a bit more about this in my book on friendship. Thank you for the question. It's great. I'm lurking back here. Anyone else ready? Yes. I have like a gazillion questions, but I had to save some for the panel. But what would you say to someone who just, who's like, I don't know, man, Augustine just sounds really depressing. He sounds so negative about sex. Like what a downer. That's not appealing. I don't know. Prove me wrong. Yeah. What would you say to that yeah. perspective? Um, Yes, Augustine does have that reputation <laughs> uh, of being very um, sort of suspicious of sex. Um, I think it's important to say a couple of things. He does not believe that married couples should refrain from sex. Um, he thinks that it is part of God's purposes. He thinks that it is the means by which children are welcomed into the world. Um, so, you know, he, he, he fully expects that it's, it's part of the Christian life for married people. Um, I think, we, so that'd be one point. I think I would also raise the question of, so if we don't go with Augustine, if we say that, that um, you know, this, this whole original sin idea is just too dark, too dour, you know, sex is, it, we need to be sex positive, right? You know, uh, sex is good. Uh, it's, it's, it's good to not be ashamed of it. It's good to, you know, enjoy it as much as you can. Um, I think we should ask about what are, what might be the hidden costs of that sort of worldview where we don't have much of a mechanism to talk about. So what happens when sex is profoundly unfulfilling or violent or exploitative or, um, you know, or is, or is, um, unavailable for, for, uh, you know, medical or, or, or natural reasons or whatever. Um, I think that, that some of our cultural sunniness, some of our positivity is actually out of touch with the actual sex that we're having uh, or, uh, you know, sex as we know it in this, in this world. So um, there, one of my favorite books is a book called Original Sin by Alan Jacobs. Um, and he has a whole chapter on Augustine. And he says, you know, Augustine has this horrible reputation as being the guy who always wanted to talk about sin. But he said, if you actually think about what unites us together, what actually makes for human community, it's not usually that we think, oh, so-and-so, or that group of people over there, they're so nice, I'm gonna, I'm gonna love them. It's actually, it's actually the negative. It's, I recognize those folks over there are struggling and failing just as much as I am. And maybe I can then show compassion to them in the same way I would hope for compassion for myself. So I think there's a, there's a way in which the Augustinian vision of sin, that it's, that it's universal, it's all pervasive, it actually allows us to be more tolerant and more compassionate toward others who are struggling with it as much as we are. That's, I, I, that's probably not a great answer. I, there's a lot more that could be said, but thanks, thanks for the question. Yeah. Good question. Crowd's kind of sleepy. Got to wake up. It's a rainy night. <laughs> Who's next? Someone, yes? Uh, I'm just wondering, when you say sanctification, what does that mean to you? I think of sanctification as the, the gradual, slow, never perfected in this life, journey of becoming more Christ-like, becoming more virtuous, um, becoming more penitent about our ongoing sinfulness. So it's, 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 a, it's a lifelong process of 
ascetic transformation, you know, self-denying transformation, where I, um, I am brought to see my own sin more and more clearly and to mourn it and to hopefully forsake it. And I'm drawn more and more into a life of faith, hope, and love. Maybe I'll take the chance to ask a question, Dr. Hill. Um, I feel like one of the challenges for this conversation is simply that to affirm or to not affirm in our current political moral climate is to like affirm or deny the very like overall existence or worth of a person as it relates yeah. to their sexual identity and sexual self-expression. So you're this kind of rare case that we can put up there because you seem to have a more conservative traditional view which could deny the goodness of self-expression and sexual activity as a gay man and yet you also affirm the goodness and wholeness of your own person <laughs> very well and mm. apparently other people. That seems to be this tortured middle position that our culture can't tolerate. So there's people that just feel like you can say all that stuff about goodness and dignity and equality, but if you don't think that this yeah. expression of this part of my sense of self and desires is good and right and true, then you've, you've canceled me sort of from the universe in some way. So how do we actually get beyond that impasse of saying, it's like saying two important things at once in a way that actually creates dialogue. Yeah. Man, it's such a good question. And I, I do struggle with that, obviously, like, like many of us. Um, I think part of what I was trying to do tonight is to take a very polarized conversation and slightly shift the, the framing of it or shift the pieces of it in the hopes that we might actually be able to have that conversation, that what you just described, in a way that that isn't simply shouting at one another. You know, you're you're denying my personhood, or you know, you're denying the the created order. Um, you know, is there a way to 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 um, to approach it from a slightly different angle of vision? So I, I mean, if I had my preference, I would just like to get that whole idea of affirming or not affirming out of the conversation because I think it I think it presumes that it presumes a basic unfallen goodness of of our sexuality it seems to me and so the question is whether it, it's not it's not a question of how is my sexuality in need of redemption it it's it's my sexuality is good as it is right now and therefore it simply needs to be affirmed or in the case of the conservative viewpoint not affirmed, but you know, as as um, so, uh, Steve Holmes, who's a theologian who I have taken a lot uh, of insight from, um, he says, you know, there's that old book by Stanley Grenz about homosexuality called "Welcoming but Not Affirming," and he says, you know, that that's a great title as far as it goes, but that should be the the title for a, every book on heterosexuality as well. We are all welcomed into the church. We're welcomed into a life of discipleship, but none of us, whether we're gay or straight or wherever we are on the sexuality spectrum, none of us simply gets to be affirmed in who we presently are. That's not, that's not the Christian good news. The Christian good news is that God finds us where we are and then, and then rescues us, you know, saves us and, and, and transforms us. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think that a lot of what I'm trying to do right now is, is unsettle the terms of the conversation as we've inherited them and see if we could actually have a more, um, you know, I would love to have a, 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 a genuine dialogue with someone who, who says what you just hypothetically, you know, said. So, um, yeah, thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Yes, I'm sorry. Here you go. Thank you. Um, I don't want to do this. Uh, I really like that you didn't throw out a list of here's what everybody should do with their lives, but um, I do think that people have a hard time imagining possible structures that, of discipline that could educate the desires of gay people from within sort of like the traditional whatever worldview. So I wondered if you have seen kind of examples of forms or structures of education of desire, sanctification, discipline uh, that have been good. And since we started out by talking about power relations, maybe suggest things that might need to change in order for those structures and forms of discipline to be as available to gay people hmm. as
as uh, marriage and other forms of hmm. discipleship are to straight people. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I think, <clears throat> I think in my own life, one of the structures that has allowed me to learn whatever of love I've been able to learn so far in my life has been a kind of intentional community. And um, I would love for that model of people living with one another, sharing life together, to be more available, both to straight and gay people. Um, I think it is beginning to be that, from what I can tell. Uh, I, I have met a lot of younger Christians, even, even just this past week, I was in Seattle doing some speaking, and there are a number of young uh, Christian couples and singles who've chosen to move into the same neighborhood so that they can uh, be in one another's homes more easily throughout the week. Um, so they worship at the same church, and then they're, they're together. Um, I would love to see vowed friendships be available and celebrated in our churches. I think that they are still viewed uh, with deep suspicion in many conservative Protestant churches. Um, I think that they're viewed as uh, near occasions of sin um, because they're certainly when it's, you know, two people who are gay, uh, who are of the same sex, um, that's viewed as, you know, just kind of playing with fire as it were. Um, I would love for that to be I would love for that to be not our first reaction when we think about celibate partnerships or vowed friendships. Um, and I think, I mean, in my corner of the church, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm in the mainline church, but I, a lot of my ministry is in the evangelical world. Uh, and I just think there is still, there is still an operating assumption that the the, the lives that need the most support and instruction and encouragement are, are the lives of married people with children. I mean, I, I, I won't name the church, but I went to a, a, an evangelical church, prominent evangelical church a few years ago. Uh, I was invited to speak at a conference they were hosting on singleness. And, um, you know, they told me when, when I got there that like 65% of their church members are single, young singles. And this was the first time in decades they had had any kind of programming on singleness. They had done retreats on marriage. They had, they had done, uh, you know, conferences on parenting. But they hadn't, they hadn't talked about singleness. And I just thought, wow, even in a church where the majority of your people are single, there's still this inertia. There's still this kind of, um, yeah, I think this kind of core evangelical uh, conviction that that it's it's the nuclear family that needs that needs the the kind of support and and guidance there. So, um, I'm not I'm not coming up with much more on the spot. Do you do you have anything you'd want to add, Eve? Uh, we'll hear more from you tomorrow. But, yeah, yeah. Thank you. It's great preview tomorrow. Yes, sir. Thank you. I have a question more about like uh, critical theory. Sure. Um, so my question is, why should we focus on the motives behind people's arguments? Shouldn't we just solely focus on discerning which arguments are truthful? Thank you. Yes, uh, I think I'm in agreement with that. I I apologize if I uh, if I fail to live up to my own ideal on that. Um, yeah. I mean, I think I think that a lot of what I find in queer theory is is not something I feel the need to oppose as a Christian. Um, and I, I, I certainly wouldn't want to say that, you know, if I, if I feel able to discern the motives of a Michel Foucault or a Judith Butler, that that somehow obviates my need to engage their arguments. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think I'm in agreement. And, and I apologize if anything I said was sort of out of step with that. Could I just add to that, Dr. Hill? I, th I wonder, are you ceding too much to queer theory in this kind of like um, the polarization of the two forms of normal that appeal to the natural? And I think that that was a brilliant um, stroke of argument. But then the next part is about 
I don't know, creation, fall, redemption, yes. restoration, aren't yeah. there like vestiges of the created yeah. order that lead to that vision of marriage that are still like intelligible after the fall or something? Yes, I, that's a great question. I, and I think, I think the answer is yes. Um, and that's, I mean, if I continue to develop this argument, which I hope to do, that's going to need a lot of attention because obviously creation is a theological category that we have to hang on to in Christian theology. Um, but I think I want to try to disentangle what Christians mean by creation from what um, historians or cultural anthropologists or, you know, uh, uh, psychologists mean by normal or, or natural. Yeah. Um, and of course, there's a whole history of debate in Christianity about, you know, how do we have access to what nature teaches, um, you know, particularly given the effects of the fall right. on our powers of observation and reason. But yes, I do want to say, I do want to say that 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 obviously with Augustine, marriage. There's a continuity between the pre-fall ordination of marriage, the the givenness of marriage, and and the marriage that we enjoy today. Um, there's a, there's a thread of continuity there, so I, I wouldn't want to sever that. Sure, no, that's good. Yeah. Time for a last question um, or two, if we can get some excitement going. Abby O'Groton, here you go. Hi, yeah, um, I've just been thinking a lot, especially in this season, I work a lot in youth ministry and in young adults ministry, and I was wondering if you could speak to your experience. Um, a lot of youth and young adults were living in a world that um, elevates one part of human experience as the entirety of our identity, and how do we speak out of a place of love and like bringing the peace that truly is of the gospel while also not sacrificing convictions out of fear of hurting people? Like, how do we love well um, not from a place of fear, but truly from a place of like belief in the power of the gospel, um, that like your identity is as a son and daughter of the king and not as like however you are um, identifying in the world, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I think that we probably need to bear in mind that a lot of, a lot of young gay youth um, in the church, even in 2022 are are experiencing shame. Um, I, I think that it is uh, it's easy to sort of think, uh, you know, we now have legalized same sex marriage. We now have you know the White House lit up with with pride colors. Um, you know, surely we've turned a corner. And um, I'm not sure. I, I think that it still, um, even in in modern day America, it's still very difficult to be gay. Um, especially if you're a person of faith, um, because you know you're in the minority for one thing. Your your experience is is not the majority, um, and Christians often don't have a lot of practice in in approaching this matter with charity and nuance and um, subtlety and uh, an appreciation of the complexity of the situation. So. I would want to underscore just the importance of listening, the importance of not making assumptions about what a person might mean if they come out to you, um, the importance of um, stressing that there is a future that is that is open to you, that you can have a a, a calling um, that is not simply about saying no to something, not simply about denying yourself, um, but there's a there's a there's a future, you know. Um, um, yeah, it's one of the reasons I'm so excited about about Eve's work um, is because I think there's there's this um, there's this deep recognition that we we need to experience the tenderness of God. We've heard a lot of loud religious voices um, assuring us that we are you know worse off than other sinners, that we are more broken than other Christians, and I think we just need to be reminded of the the extravagant, generous. Uh, tender love of, of God. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. One last question. No. Yeah? No. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Phil Smith, take us home. This may be a rabbit trail. Um, what do affirming and... Um, <clears throat> Uh, progressive Christians say about polyamory? 
it's not a conversation I've followed closely. Um, my impression is that there's a spectrum of different views, and you would find some some Christians who strike me as not in, not in the mainstream. I mean, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm thinking. I'm, I won't name names, but I'm thinking of one Christian voice I know who is who is publicly um, come out in favor of polyamory, and I'm not. I'm not sure he would be a traditional Nicene Christian. Um, so I think it's a conversation that's that's still in still in the beginning stages, but others may know more. Yeah, it's a big question, Phil. <laughs> Sheesh. <laughs> I, th I think the way you speak, Wes, and I know Eve tomorrow, just the what, all of our longings for one another mm. um, in friendship and certainly in romance and eros are all calling out deep unto deep to a greater longing um, that somehow we all get to experience in God himself by hope and with each other. And I just think the more we can think about that, then figure out what the practical, visible, tangible representations of are that for that in community, in time here at a college, at a church. It's such a great challenge. And yeah, I just so appreciate you coming and bringing your testimony and your words, your insight, and this, what a great way to kick it off. So please do join us tomorrow for Eve Tushnet, who's with us, and tomorrow night for Nancy Percy, yet again, another perspective, and the panel after that tomorrow night, I think, to really have had these three tables, or these three views on the table, and Dr. Favalli will not disappoint, so be back uh, tomorrow night at 7 p.m. <laughs> It'll be good. Um, grab a book, and we'll see if we can get um, Dr. Hill to sign up. Thank you guys for being here uh, tonight. It's a pleasure and honor to have you, and we'll see you tomorrow at 1.30, hopefully. Thanks.